Michael. Okay, so uh, good morning. We are 37 minutes late, and we will finish on time, which means 12.30. Uh, great. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, yeah. Uh, so, uh, GDPR is upon us. Uh, we have witnessed uh, GDPR panic over the last few months uh, for all those who have waited until the last minute uh, because they, it, you know, they just did not read uh, the document that was there for two years. So in this panel, uh, we will be, guys, may I ask you not to disturb, thank you. Uh, uh, in this panel, we will be trying to figure out some of uh, the mysteries of the GDPR and its coverage and its scope, and we will be doing so with the three panelists uh, that are here. Uh, I will not present them extensively because you can go online and see that. Uh, just uh, to say uh, short words about each. Um, Karolina Mozesovic, I hope I got that more or less right. Uh, is the deputy head of unit uh, responsible for data protection in the European Commission and has been inv involved extensively in uh, GDPR uh, discuss discussions. Jocelyn Aqua uh, is partner at PwC for a year and a half now, but previously she has been working with the uh, Department of Justice in the United States for more than 15 years and has dealt in that capacity with uh, GDPR issues as well. Uh, and Cameron Carey is former general counsel of uh, the Department of Commerce in the United States and in that capacity uh, Cameron has uh, more or less authored uh, the uh, Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights under the Obama administration. Right? Uh, so uh, it's a great panel. And, uh, let's, uh, and I'm Michael Burnack, I'm Associate Dean uh, for Research at the Tel Aviv University Faculty of Law. So, uh, in order to make some sense of what is going on, we can differentiate, I think, and it might be helpful, between the company level, the national level, and the EU and global sort of levels, and figure out what's going on there. And in order for us to get started, here are three quick uh, scenarios and I'd love to hear your short uh, comments on those and then we will continue. Scenario number one, an Israeli researcher, let's say here at Tel Aviv University, conducts an online survey with 500 people around the world, some of whom might be in Japan, some of whom might be in the United States and some, let's say, in Poland or some other EU country. Uh, that's, and let's add to that that the research has received the IOB uh, approval. Second scenario, uh, Israeli Ministry of Tourism ran a campaign uh, to encourage Europeans to hop over to Tel Aviv earlier this month to participate in the Pride events which drew over 250,000 people. Part of the campaign included a landing page online in which uh, anybody, Europeans included, were encouraged to leave their contacts uh, for f future uh, information. And the third scenario, a typical one, an Israeli startup, let's say just a startup, a small one at the, for the time being, developing a product or service that will assist companies in uh, complying with various regulations. This is uh, law tech or legal tech. Uh, maybe even including compliance with the GDPR. And this company has clients all over the world, companies and individuals, including in the EU. So scenario one is the researcher, scenario two is the government, and the third one is of the startup. Uh, Jocelyn, let's begin with you. What do you recommend? <laughs> for each one, should I for go For each one, there? briefly, or sure. for, for the one you choose to focus on, as um, you wish. Well, I, maybe I'll focus a little bit. I, I can do the first two, how about that? Um, so for the researchers, uh, I, would, I would think that if they're dealing in a global environment to try and, and work through this, um, first looking at Israel's laws, which are pretty um, uh, protective on the security side, but then really start thinking about it in terms of GDPR, which I like is a really good framework for privacy. Um, you would need a privacy notice. You'd have to really be able to have those 500 people um, uh, have the consent of what the data is going to be collected for, how you're using it, um, if there's any onward transfer, and some real clear notice of how it's being done. The system has to be secure. 
I would say that you had said it to us previously, I don't know if you mentioned it, that the data would be anonymous. I think that's a real hard thing to show, to, to, to prove. I think you'd have to treat the data as it's not, and then um, that would be an added benefit, that it would be not identifiable. I think we've seen in the press recently about how data that's not um, identified by an individual can still identify you in the Fitbit and the other types of, of data that people have seen. So having the data protected in a way that would um, uh, be secure regardless of what you would be able to do with it. So I, I do think having that clear transparency and notice and consent and security and limits on use are going to be essential regardless of, of, of mm -hmm. what country that you're, you're going to be, since it's really global. I would say that the marketing for a, a, an Israeli um, government um, entity is, a, is something that I have been asked by the U.S. government because I spent so many years working on U.S.-EU negotiations and then by private sector companies also asking PwC whether I provide GDPR implementation advice to U.S. federal agencies. And my answer is strongly no. Um, we are, and there may be people that dis, um, disagree with me, but um, it is a foreign sovereign. And so the answer is, uh, regardless, you, if you want to be an adequate and essentially equivalent government, you do that on those terms and on maybe it's a U.S.-EU or U.S.-Israeli adequacy agreement um, and you are responsible for handling the data in that capacity. I wouldn't say it, uh, it is the um, obligation of a foreign government to import a foreign law and um, use all of the, the requirements of that foreign law as, as the basis and grounds for protecting data in that, in that country. Um, it starts to get a little different when you start dealing with municipalities that have um, business enterprises and whether those businesses are doing business with another, uh, I would say that it starts to get to be a more slippery slope, but if it's the ministry of some country. And then the last one you said for startups. I think startups are a perfect time to really get your privacy uh, in order. You are, new, new comp companies have cloud um, available, you, you're available to use cloud services that are um, usually um, large cloud service providers are now GDPR compliant. You have, can start in your data retention and life cycle and, and privacy impact assessments and considering privacy by design at the very beginning so you're not in this situation that U.S. <coughs> companies have been for the last few years trying to figure out where all their data is and what to do with it and how to delete it, and all those big things. So I would say on, those, on that one, the, it's the time for getting involved in privacy is really... We, yeah. We'll get later to the ability of a startup we can talk about that to, too, to but how to do issues. it, but right. this is the perfect so, time. Thank you. Uh, Cam? Um, well, I, uh, thank you. I mean, I'm not uh, certainly surprised that there's a uh, wide interest in the GDPR given its, uh, its, its ambition and its territorial scope. Um, uh, sorry, I've uh, uh, been dealing with the GDPR since it was in draft and, and it's somewhat maybe to the annoyance of some people in, in Europe, but it does have, uh, uh, have that impact. And I think these, uh, uh, these, these uh, scenarios uh, illustrate that. Uh, since you took on the first, I'll, I'll talk about the, the second and, uh, and the third. I think the, the second to my, I, I agree with, with Jocelyn on, on uh, the approach, I think this illustrates sort of a com common misconception about uh, the GDPR that simply because you may have some interaction with Europeans, uh, uh, it may come into play. Um, uh, I certainly understand uh, uh, you know, the regulation and Article 3 as requiring uh, more, purpose more purposeful and significant contacts uh, than, than that. So in this situation, there is no establishment in the EU. Um, there's uh, um, you know, some processing of data of EU data subjects, uh, but there's not an offering of goods and services uh, in the EU. Um, and there's simply you know, the, the people on the other end recording their names and addresses if they're interested in coming to Israel. That's not monitoring of behavior. So those are the things I think are, are required uh, under the article. I think the second scenario, as, 
uh, I mean, the third, uh, as Jocelyn indicated, um, does uh, probably involve uh, some monitoring of behavior of EU uh, data subjects, and, you know, on uh, at, at uh, some scale uh, you know, relative to the size of the enterprise. Uh, so there, I would say, GDPR comes into play. Carolina, do you agree with this? Uh, well, uh, do, um, <laughs> oh, well, let me develop. <laughs> um, I think that for concerning the first scenarios about the researcher, I would uh, focus again on the question, are we having here something that would that could be uh, interpreted as offering goods and services uh, in the EU? Is the EU specifically targeted? And um, is there monitoring ongoing? In, in the description you, you made, we didn't have really much information about it. And um, it did not look like um, uh, offering goods and services. I think that in general, and I'm going through the, the two other scenarios, I, um, I, will, um, uh, I will develop a little bit more about it, but I think that there's a general misconception and, and certain inflation of the outreach and on the interpretation of Article 3. And I think that the, the, the guidelines on which the, the board, European Data Protection Board, is working now will bring their um, clarification. But so far we can still build on elements provided for in the recitals, uh, recital 23 and recital 24. So there, and so these elements, I will also need them in order to address um, the second and the third scenario, there are the elements like mere accessibility is not enough. Yeah? It needs to be so one element. Mere accessibility, not enough. Second, it needs to be apparent that the controller, so the organization, is envisaging offering goods or services to data subjects in the union. And uh, so we have here this EU consumer first facing element. This is very important. By monitoring is monitoring the behavior of data subjects in the union. It's uh, tracking when and then subsequent use of the data. Therefore, with this research, first of all, I'm a little bit less uh, uh, reluctant to accept claims about anonymous data. I think that it can be done. There are means to do it. And in the moment we have an anonymous data, of course, up to the standards and everything. And let's not say, let's not forget, again, recitals are very, uh, very instructive in this, um, in this respect. There needs to be so the, 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 the means which need to be employed in order to assess whether the data is anonymous needs to be reasonable. So uh, it's, it's uh, reasonably likely to in identify. So it does not go to this completely absolute impossibility, of course, in the light of, uh, of accountability principle, always the check if in view of the develop, uh, development of the technologies, it would need to be assessed whether the development of the technology does not nullify this anonymous, uh, 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 the process of anonymization. But in the moment there is an anonymous data, we are completely outside of the GDPR altogether. Mm -hmm. The second example, again, um, I, I would like to, so I would start to analyze in this offer, I mean, is it an offer? Is it? Is it a mere, mere accessibility? Were there some packages in there offered? Was there some, uh, you know, indication there will be discounts if you are going through our page now and you will land on the page of the hotels? Um, there would need to be something a little bit more of, 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 uh, uh, of targeting, a little bit more of uh, this uh, apparent to envisage uh, to offer goods and services to data subject. And in the third example, again, was it so this example of an SME which offers GDPR assessment to everybody? As we see, we are in Israel, we are discussing GDPR, so GDPR concerns are not merely European. And uh, then the mere fact that somebody is discussing GDPR does not mean that it will target the European market only. So again, uh, um, was it a particularly EU uh, uh, customer-facing offer or not? So, so it seems that for you the answers are pretty clear. And I would add on your behalf that this a, a disclaimer that this was not legal advice, right? But a startup, a company, a small company, not yet rich, not yet big, 
the resources they need to find out whether the GDPR applies or not, and read the recitals and understand them, etc., etc., that might, you know, it, that, that assumes that they are aware at all of the GDPR and, you know, have a general idea so that they can seek legal advice to begin with. So I'm pretty sure that within a year or two we will hear lots of statistics about how expensive or, you know, what, what were the actual costs of implementing the GDPR were for European and, and non-European companies and organizations, not only companies such as, you know, universities and governments, etc. What does the GDPR mean for companies. Jocelyn? Well, so just to go back to, again to what we've been discussing, yep. for instance, the researchers, in, and there are 500 people. These are smaller entities, smaller really? requests, and it's very difficult for them to have like the legal knowledge and background to really parse through the articles of, a, of the GDPR. Or when you're thinking in a global environment where you're um, sending out um, survey re requests or, or globally, or you're, or you're marketing globally to people in a way that you could get um, people from all over the world, what kind of a standard do you use um, practically and what does it affect? And the reason why I am a fan of GDPR is that it, I think it sets a framework um, to, to uh, of, of security. It, it focuses more on data protection and, and, and data use than as much on data security, but I think if you're focused on Israel, Israel has the security requirements in place as well, that it's something to give a company where it really doesn't know where to start a framework. And so you're, you're right that maybe if it's anonymous or if, it's, if, it, if, if it is maybe not a targeting, focusing on that individual, what is a company to do when they're really just not sure? They don't, they don't have that, that granularity to know. You could either really parse it out as and you can get legal advice and so that you're really out of scope. You can figure that out. But then where do you where are you? And what happens if all of a sudden six months from now you realize you're back in scope or you make one tweak. So for companies that are small and, and while it, it may be expensive to do some of the requirements and and gather a data, you may not need to do everything. I'm a big fan of the ICO's website, the um, the UK's website because it really does focus on micro companies and small businesses and what to do for a small business to have to do some of the compliance requirements. And, and sometimes that's enough if you're dealing with, you have maybe 10 people from the Philippines and five people from South Korea and then four from Poland. It starts to get very overwhelming for companies. Right. And so, so I would say that sometimes parsing out that article that doesn't make it apply to you is, is it just it may not be effective. That is also the stage when we expect them or require them, if the GDPR applies, to conduct uh, a privacy impact assessment and do privacy by design, data protection by design, whatever that means, which, you know, for a company just starting up, they might not have the foggiest idea of what, what exactly to do. Mm -hmm. Cameron? This yeah, point. so I, I think those uh, those are challenges, Michael, but I, I would go back to Isabel uh, Fakpiratin's sort of opening uh, comments and, and point to, to a couple of things. I mean, I think she, she talked, I think, very appropriately to the need for a data governance framework. Um, uh, and I think one of the positive aspects of of the GDPR has been to uh, sort of force uh, companies uh, across the board to look at what data are we collecting, why are we collecting it, what are we doing with it. Um, and the reality is that that is something that you know, any company, startup or otherwise, needs to think about uh, uh, in uh, any, uh, any enterprise, any business plan that involves the collection of data. Uh, similarly, to be thinking about uh, security. So you know, that, I think, is, is really the important lesson of privacy by design. I think you know, as, a, uh, as a legal principle, I think it's, it's a difficult one, right? What is, when do you fail to, to uh, you know, have privacy by, by design? Uh, is there, uh, if you, it's, you know, the, in American common law, there's the concept of negligence uh, in the air. Um, you know, have you, 
committed negligence in the air if you have adequate privacy, but you, somehow you haven't followed the steps of privacy by design. But the notion that you need to think about privacy and think about security from the ground up uh, is, uh, is an important one. At the same time, uh, Isabel talked about uh, uh, the making the GDPR uh, an adaptive uh, and a flexible uh, instrument uh, and the need to do that in this technology space. And I, you know, that was uh, a key element of what we sought to do in the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. Uh, uh, and I think something that needs to be an important part of regulation uh, in this space. So I was heartened by that. Um, I think that I would hope that European regulators and regulators elsewhere in the world would look at some things like sort of sandboxing solutions uh, uh, that would allow some experimentation, allow startups uh, uh, to kind of explore uh, new areas and you know, the, the notion uh, that one needs to be able to fail, to innovate and make progress, uh, should somehow uh, get recognized in regulation. When the fine is 20 million euros or 4% yep. of whatever, that's a bit, you know, that, there's a bit of a risk there. So, Carolina? What, what should well, the startups before yeah. I will come to this, you know, credible uh, means of enforcement, in particular when one moves from the means of enforcement ex ante to ex post, right. which will not work if there is not, uh, you know, a carrot in the sense of if you comply, then you do not face the fine. But I would like to mention some other things, building on what was said also in the morning. So indeed, I mean, the regulation is based a part of the principle, this uh, data protection by design and by default, on the principle of risk-based approach. This is all done so that we can maintain technological neutrality. So in, we are moving from this, uh, uh, we moved already, from this environment of everything very much controlled, authorized, notified, to more freedom with a self-assessment that comes with consequences. And they need to be because we cannot have people free riding on non-compliance. Yeah? It needs the compliance, somebody who is compliant and somebody who invested in compliance cannot not have an advantage of it uh, in comparison to somebody who did not do the whole work and the investment. So, from this technological neutrality and all the means, the tools the regulation provides for, like data protection impact assessment, like records, it all helps companies to map, to manage the data they have, to organize themselves also in order to be able to answer to all the requests and to, to, to enable us um, the possibility to exercise our rights. How somebody will be able to respond to my access request if somebody, if this organization just does not know when they have the data and if the data is still uh, somewhere else. So I think that, um, you know, this uptake and the use of data and generation of data, it was, it went so quickly that the, 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 the legal tools framing this a little bit were a little bit slower. And the question was how to give the freedom, but frame it and provide for responsibility. Now the fines, because this is what you, what you mentioned. Let's not forget that the fines will be with not only 4% cap, but 2% cap, yet already the regulation itself provides for two groups of infringement. And in Article 83, the regulation provides for an obligation each and every time Data Protection Authority calculates, decides first of all to impose the fine, and then to calculates the fine, to be proportionate and dissuasive. So this element of proportionality is seen there, and all the uh, the list of Article 83 needs to be go needs to be applied plus additional elements. So we have nature, gravity, dura duration. We have all possible attenuating and aggravating circumstances. And coming back to the discussion on SMEs, the whole technological neutrality and the whole risk-based approach is precisely about it. That it's not about the size. We can have very big organizations who hardly process 
data or process data of employees only. And then we can have, and this is precisely what happens, very small startups, garages, uh, really, you know, uh, two, four super hype intelligent people who think like, wow, data, we will just process it. We cannot attach it to the size of the company. It's about what does it mean for those whose data is being processed. So, so therefore, this, this all is saying small companies and so on and so on. But how to cushion them? What is being done so that those who process heavily and should actually impose on themselves a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, of obligations, what is being done? It's precisely the work of the board. It's precisely the guidelines, precisely the outreach from different DPAs, from the commission. The, um, the page of the ICO, our tools, um, everything that uh, the Article 29, under the guidance of uh, uh, Madame falke Peraton did, and now the European Data Protection Board, this is all precisely to give more legal certainty, to caution the situation of when, so that the regulation maintains technologically neutral, there are some terms which need to be interpreted. So. So, I, I, I would like to continue, uh, but I just the, the 20 million, you know, it's a flag there, and uh, people have cognitive biases, so, so you know they see the 20 million there. Uh, let, let's move from the company level to the country level. Uh, so adequacy, that's the key word uh, uh, over here. And let, let's bring in the Israeli case, uh, just as an example, but it's not the only one. Uh, Israel has uh, the official adequacy as of 2011. Um, just as uh, by means of disclosure, I was subcontractor for the EU Commission at the time on, on this matter. Uh, last year in this conference, uh, Bruno Conferelli, where's Bruno? Is he here? No? Okay. Uh, announced as, well, you know, it was no surprise for anybody who read the GDPR, that the EU Commission will reopen and reassess uh, all the 10 or so countries that have received uh, the adequacy uh, stamp uh, uh, earlier. Uh, the Israeli government has uh, is said to have submitted a lengthy document to the EU about Israel's state, status, but the Israeli government refuses to disclose that, uh, that document, so I have no idea what's written there, I can only guess. So, so let's talk about the adequacy, uh, let's figure out the process and its relevance. So Cameron, can you first please walk uh, us through briefly kind of, you know, the process and what does that mean? Sure. Um, well, the, the GDPR uh, sort of uh, sustains uh, the principle that transfers to uh, third countries, countries outside the EU are uh, not permitted unless uh, those are adequate, uh, those countries are found adequate or unless certain uh, mechanisms and safeguards uh, are, are in place. Um, uh, it has our codified uh, uh, the Schrems uh, decision, so set uh, a series of criteria for an adequ adequacy determination that reflect the judgment uh, in that case. Um, and it has also uh, explicitly authorized uh, uh, BCRs and uh, model clauses, uh, uh, that, you know, some were developments uh, uh, you know, by regulatory bodies uh, under uh, under the uh, directive. Uh, so, uh, Schrems, uh, in Schrems, uh, the CJU said uh, that uh, uh, the Commission must periodically uh, revisit adequacy determinations uh, in light of developments uh, since uh, any adequacy decision uh, was taken. Um, and also uh, said and faulted uh, the, the key fault uh, of the Commission in the U.S. Safe Harbor decision was the failure uh, to consider issues of government access uh, uh, to, to information, government surveillance, law enforcement, uh, intelligence surveillance and law enforcement uh, collection. Um, uh, so those are the things that are now uh, incumbent upon the Commission uh, under the decision and also under uh, the, the GDPR. So I think there are lessons uh, from uh, the, the determinations in the privacy shield process uh, uh, that, that Israel will have to, to deal with. So you know, clearly, um, uh, you know, the, the subject to what happens in the revision of the Personal Data Act, um, uh, you know, the developments uh, 
uh, in the law will be certainly similar and on the commercial side, uh, uh, you know, Israel should have a strong case uh, for, uh, for adequacy. You have a comprehensive law. We don't uh, in the United States, but um, you know, the, the uh, privacy shield principles put in place some, some uh, equivalent uh, protections. Um, uh, Israel, uh, you know, with uh, that law, with the uh, court decisions applying that law, um, uh, it will have a strong regime and one that will be, be reinforced by amendments. So I think the sensitive issues will come in the analysis uh, uh, of uh, you know, the government surveillance. Uh, Israel certainly has uh, an active uh, uh, intelligence uh, and counterterrorism uh, program. Um, it is not a member of the Five Eyes uh, Alliance. Uh, as the UK, Canada, New Zealand, other countries uh, uh, that, that you know, have adequacy decisions uh, will face. Um, uh, but it does have a great you know, high level of intelligence uh, cooperation with the United States. Um, so, and I think the, the real challenge will be, I think you know, the United States had to make some radical transformations in its level of transparency with respect to uh, to intelligence surveillance as a response to to the Snowden uh, revelations, um, right. and that has sort of set a new bar. Um, so I think for privacy advocates, uh, uh, for regulators to sort of push uh, that out, that was certainly one of the challenges in the United States. Uh, uh, in the privacy shield process was to sort of get uh, an active discussion by our intelligence uh, community, Jocelyn uh, uh, and the general counsel of uh, the, the, uh, the intelligence uh, uh, coordinator in the United States, met on numerous times with members of the Article 29 Working Party. Um, and uh, there was a lot of education about how the laws operated. So, so, Carolina, how do you see that process, the adequacy process from, from the European side generally and specifically in the Israeli case? Uh, because, you know, if you read the Israeli Privacy Protection Act, which has not been amended since 2007, although there are data security regulations, uh, it's clearly incompatible with the GDPR in many aspects as it is now. So. What will happen with Well, I wouldn't course. like to take, a, you know, positions compatible, not compatible. We are in discussions with the uh, Israeli government. But uh, let me start with, uh, um, with, with you, you know, like frames. First of all, Israel got already an adequacy decision. And we were underlying all this that and the GDPR, from the substantive point of view, is really building on what the Directive 95 was providing for. Then, both EU and Israel recognize that privacy and data protection are fundamental rights and require strong protections. Coming back to what, was, um, to what Cameron just said, the, the three elements which we all is take into account while assessing this um, this uh, essentially equivalent level of protection of our data while it is uh, traveling abroad are the elements of independent supervi uh, supervisory authority is enforceable rights. Um, we are always saying that adequacy is not a photocopy or our adequacy finding does not require a photocopy of uh, the uh, the foreign uh, legislation, as it was uh, uh, seen in the privacy shield, um, also um, uh, countries which do not have an um, omnibus uh, um, act which, com uh, which encompasses all the uh, data protection uh, aspects, but where the system is much more fragmented, was found uh, equivalent by us. I think what will help in, uh, um, in, in, in the 
um, evaluation how the discussions between Israel and the EU will go, will continue, is also the um, adequacy referential adopted by the uh, by the Article 29 and now readopted by the by the board in in, in February. Concerning all the issues on uh, national security, so this uh, um, access the enforcement uh, uh, for, for enforcement authorities. Um, well, after Schrems, there is uh, the court told us that we have to consider the whole cycle of the of, of the whole life cycle of the data. So it's not only that it was gathered for business purposes and sent on the basis of uh, uh, adequacy or, or something else uh, uh, than abroad, but uh, also what can happen to, uh, uh, afterwards. And here are very normal principles of uh, proportionality and necessity apply. Um, we have um, um, our courts um, and the Strasbourg court being very uh, critical or very vigilant concerning the uh, surveillance. And um, the Digital Rights Island uh, uh, judgment tells us already a lot about what you, uh, what we did wrong. Uh, Tele2 shows how the member states did not interpret uh, uh, and did not apply the, 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 the e-privacy directive correctly. Uh, Strasbourg court uh, um, said something uh, concerning the Hungarian uh, surveillance law. So I think bearing in, um, in mind this element, it already gives, uh, uh, gives some, uh, some guidance. Um, we underline again it's uh, GDPR, it's an evolution and there um, uh, and there we also, of course, uh, very much see and bear in mind that, um, uh, well, Israel, although you're saying that the laws are stemming from I don't know what, but recently adopted new laws, um, new laws there are new provisions uh, concerning data breaches, and um, um, yeah. Yeah. Jocelyn, you were involved on the American side with uh, security issues, you're right, and with the Schrems, uh, Schrems 1. And, and Schrems 2. Schrems, that Schrems too, two. okay. Uh, but so, so two points. One is, uh, if you talk about adequacy and what happened with the Isle of Man and Israel and all of those other countries that gained adequacy, I don't, there was a, car, you know, you were looking at it in terms of the 95 directive, and there was, was a law enforcement and national security carve out of that, and I don't think you did that deep dive in government access to data and national security access to data and redress that, that's happening right now. Um, so I think there, there is cause, there should be cause for concern by, in Israel as to whether they could achieve adequacy now, just like there's cause in the UK to consider whether they're going to be, mm -hmm. remain adequate. Um, I worked on the adequacy issues with Israel for, uh, with, with the United States for many years, and um, I think the courts in the, in the EU have gotten themselves in a little bit of a predicament here. You know, if, if um, privacy shield falls, if, if the Shrem's case, um, if the Court of Justice, um, finds that the, the lack of um, judicial redress in the United States or the government access to data is not essentially equivalent in the way that I think has been, um, uh, that the U.S. government and a lot of the, um, uh, the organizations that have filed, for, that have intervened in that case, then it really does sort of tumble not just privacy shield but binding corporate rules and, and, and model contract clauses because they're all basically would, would have the same underlying flaws that no matter what you do, that the government is not treating, handling the data that it acquires from businesses in a way that is considered to be essentially equivalent. And then you have to ask yourself what happens in Indonesia and in, in China and in um, you know, Brazil and every other country that does business with the EU that is not considered right now to be essentially equivalent, how would they make that high level cut? And that is really, I think, extremely problematic for, for, for trade in the EU. And so um, that's something where I think we're really looking at that carefully as to what to do next. Um, I, I do want to have a chance later if we can go back to commercial issues. Um, we were all talking about how great GDPR is. And I just want to flag that there are significant issues for companies in the United States in addition to that threat of, of fines by the regulators, and that is all of the private litigation risks. 
And so I have been spent the last two years working with those companies, and that mm -hmm. is a huge stressor for. Right. Yeah. So, so, so I was going to add something on so the intelligence yeah. piece, but oh, maybe you want to move no, uh, please, back please to do. the commercial in, in the time available. Um, okay. So so I think to sort of drill down a little bit into what will be required, uh, the the working party um, uh, is now adopted as an, an EDPB. Uh, yeah, referential. We, we have is, to learn a whole, yeah, a whole lot of is, new acronyms. Right. Um, uh, laid out sort of four elements of the analysis of uh, public bodies' access. And, um, uh, and I think actually corresponds very closely to what my firm and sort of looking at what essentially equivalent means uh, identified. And those are uh, essentially uh, that there be the grounds uh, be carefully spelled out in specifically uh, in uh, the legal authorities uh, uh, that uh, the scope be limited to what's uh, necessary and proportionate, um, that you know, there be a combination of administrative and judicial and expert oversight, uh, and that there be legal remedies and redress. Um, uh, and I think you could take some lessons from the UK, uh, Matt, to several officials there trying to figure out what they, they need to do. Um, uh, and I think they recognize they're fine on the commercial side, uh, but they have issues uh, with, with surveillance there. So it, they have revised their laws. They've uh, added layers uh, uh, of prior approval uh, and, and judicial or quasi-judicial approval um, uh, and taken uh, a number of uh, steps uh, there um, and added uh, significant transparency to the activities of, mm -hmm. of GCHQ. Right. So, so I think in the, in the last segment of our discussion, let's uh, tie the different layers together and add the third one, and that is the global. So uh, some 10 years ago or so, I looked at the global effect of the, the Data Protection Directive, and I realized, you know, this subtle sort of globalization, which I call soft legal globalization. It wasn't, you know, a treaty that required countries to do something, but it was sort of a bottom-up incentive to, to, to follow up. And uh, today, for the GDPR, some of my American colleagues look at that and say, wow, that is aggressive. Uh, so I immediately point them to a few of the IP treaties and, and some other some other issues. So so we have the company level, the national level, and this global spread, which initially I believe was unintended, but sort of became deliberate in in, in the GDPR. I think. Uh, what do you think about this global level? And we can tie it back to the company level. So Jocelyn, let's. Start sure. With well, so if you ask a multinational corporation what right. they're doing right now. Um, Primarily for the last year and a half, they would say GDPR. They, are fo they were focused on GDPR. It was not just this um, regulatory threat that they felt. It was the private right of action. It's the fact that everybody's vendors are sending them information to ask how they're dealing with data. And so it's become a real um, focal point for most U.S. multinationals as they are trying to navigate moving privacy into the forefront of their of their like C-suite and thinking about GDPR has become like a top issue for 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 most US companies and figure and, and at least the ones that are that are um, big multinationals that are doing business globally um, what GDPR was was a trigger for this to get to that level for this to get the attention that it needed at the um, at that you know, chief technology officer, chief data officer, CEO, CIO, all of the, those, those individuals to say, like, what are we doing about data use? Um, and, and it re did restructure many companies on a moving privacy by design -ish and, and, and really having um, an a, um, inner company um, level discussion of what we're doing with data in the company. Where is it? How are we using it? How are we securing it? How do we deal with all of these um, these basic governance framework issues. Now, what it has done now is made them realize, well, we really haven't been paying attention to these other laws, too, in Asia, in South America, and what's going on in the Philippines, what's going on in Vietnam. And, and I think because it was an overload for many companies who have had data in perpetuity for decades and didn't know, and you know, bought other companies and data is everywhere. It was to focus on GDPR as a framework and then start to move that into more of a global, 
a, a, a global um, privacy program. And so um, I am a big fan of GDPR because it has made you know companies think about an issue that I feel I am so passionate about and have been. Um, these some of these privacy by design, privacy governance. Um, privacy impact assessments and data access requests are things that the U.S. federal government has been doing for decades. And so bringing this to the corporate environment is a great thing, I think, and then being able to address the basic framework and look at the outliers between what is the difference between the Japan's privacy law, the Israel, Israeli privacy you know, requirements, and this is the basic framework, I think is a really strong place to be. Uh, you know, I'm still, there are still so many issues with respect to GDPR implementation that have caused companies so much um, stress over the last six months mm -hmm. with respect to 72-hour data breach notifications and getting 1,200 data, data subject requests in one day, most of them by bots. You know, there are, there are the, the huge practical implica you know, Im implications of dealing with GDPR on a global basis right now. But that, you know, thinking about this in more of a I think companies started looking at this in, only with respect to the EU and then realized very quickly that how are they going to justify focusing solely on the EU data when there's so much else out there and there's so many other similar requirements globally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, Cam, go first and then Carolina. Okay, sure. So, Michael, I, I think there's an interesting byproduct of uh, what Jocelyn just, just talked about. Uh, I, you know, it, uh, we've seen this. Uh, uh, at my law firm, Sidley Austin, where particularly in the financial services sector, but some other uh, multinationals that have some similar business structures uh, have from very early on said, we are going to adopt GDPR as a global standard, that it's easier to have one single set of policies, compliance practices, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, around the world. Uh, and of course, we've seen as well a number of uh, other multinationals, uh, um, Microsoft, uh, um, Facebook to a substantial extent have said, all right, we're going to uh, take GDPR and apply at least much of it uh, uh, and, and around then, the world. And then they transferred or said to, or have been said to have transferred mm -hmm. data from the EU, held in the EU to the US to, 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 to get out of the GDPR. Um, Perhaps, but they're still subject to they're still subject to the GDPR, and I think yeah. that's uh, that's that's uh, the piece that matters. We went through uh, the territorial reach, uh, yeah. so if you are subject to the GDPR, um, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're moving the data to the United States; uh, um, it still applies. Um, and because of that, data transfers. Uh, and adequacy actually matter uh, a lot less. Um, and I've heard some people say it becomes irrelevant. I think GDPR still requires mechanisms, so you probably don't avoid it uh, uh, altogether. But uh, under those circumstances, uh, uh, adequacy or other safeguards uh, carry a lot less freight. Uh, and, and I think that changes perhaps some of the discussion uh, uh, around adequacy, at least for companies uh, that are subject to, uh, to the GDPR. And there may be ways uh, under uh, Articles uh, uh, 40, uh, 45, 6, and 7 uh, to sort of incorporate uh, that into what are regarded as adequate uh, uh, data transfer mechanisms. Right. So the final words uh, in our session, uh, Carolina, you, you, the EU is running the show, so it's appropriate. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we are very happy about it. Should it be the case, which um, I we don't trust to. Too, well, um, just let me before I come uh, sure. adequacy does not uh, does matter uh, less. I, I think it goes together with this miscomprehension about what is actually the reach of the GDPR and which companies are subject to the GDPR. So I think having clarified that, uh, it will show that adequacy still does matter. Yeah? And that adequacy is a very, uh, it's a very, because one thing is what happens with the data uh, of our EU citizens within the EU, and then another thing is what happens when our data goes outside, which is mainly with the, or the means of, uh, of um, adequacy decision is the most secure one. 
So um, I think we, um, um, uh, I think that by clarifying the territorial reach and the, uh, of the GDPR, we will get there a little bit more of clarification. But um, what I wanted uh, to underline, we all see that the issues are global. We have seen it with Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, we have seen it with Uber. And I think, therefore, there is uh, a move and global response to it. The sensitivity is getting, uh, is getting bigger. Therefore, there are 120 um, countries around the world that uh, have now privacy laws, um, that uh, therefore uh, many more are moving towards having them. And I think here about Chile, about Brazil, and um, and therefore, also the element or accompanying with, with um, by adequacy decisions, the free, free trade agreements starts to be now so important. It's what we see in our negotiations with Japan when this is the biggest uh, free trade ag agreement which was uh, negotiated uh, uh, so far. And why is it so necessary? We do not include data in free trade agreements because it's a fundamental uh, right and so on, but therefore the need and the development of the negotiations with, uh, with Japan, which hopefully will um, end before the summer, for, in order to be able to adopt uh, double adequacy decisions, the adequacy for a decision from us to Japan and from Japan to us. Let's not forget EU uh, uh, global standard and so on. EU is the biggest exporter of data in the world. Yeah? We are the biggest exporter of data in the world. Therefore, our, the protection we want to, to, to give to, to this data uh, and needs to travel with our data, obviously, will have impact on all those who want to offer goods and services to our 250 million uh, um, as citizens. Now, um, there are a lot, if you allow me, Mike, there is a lot of discussion about us being very aggressive, imperialistic. It's not about this. This is offering benefits of our solution. It's not us imposing something, but saying, like, within this framework, you will also be able to take advantages of it. And, um, and therefore, um, uh, this... Uh, uh, from from our point of view, um, th this is uh, uh, really not uh, uh, well. Uh, this is not appropriate to speak about uh, 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 to frame this discussion in in, in this uh, in these terms. On this happy note, <laughs> our time is over. So uh, please join me in thanking our panelists.